Yo, what's up everyone? Today we're going to be doing the stoichiometry section of the 2021 USNCO local exam. Let's start with question one. Uh, at 120 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, one liter of methane reacts completely with excess oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. What volumes of the two products are produced at this pressure and temperature? As always, it helps to write the chemical reaction that's happening here. So we know CH4 reacts completely with excess oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. The thing about this reaction here is that it is not currently balanced. Um, so in order to balance it, we need a two here and a two here. Now we're asked what volumes uh, of the two products are produced at this pressure and temperature. And for reference, we're told that we have one liter of methane. Now, all of the other conditions are staying the same. The temperature, the pressure uh, are all staying the same. So the only thing that's really changing is volume and uh, the number of moles. Now we have a really useful uh, relationship that's known as Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law. And it says that volume is proportional to the number of moles of a gas. So since we have one mole of CH4 for every one mole of carbon dioxide, uh, that means for every one liter of CH4, we have one liter of CO2. And it's the same process for the water. And since water and uh, methane are in a two to one ratio, we're gonna have two liters of water. So we have one liter of carbon dioxide and two liters of water. And that is answer choice A. Let's look at question two. Uh, polypropylene is made by polymerizing propene um, how many molecules of propane must be polymerized to make 3.50 grams of polypropylene? This is a classic just dimensional analysis question. Uh, we start out with 3.50 grams of polypropylene. I'm just going to say uh, pol. In order to turn this into moles, we uh, divide by the molar mass. So 42.1 grams of polypropylene per one mole of it. Now the question asks us for uh, how many molecules of propane. So to turn moles into molecules, we have to multiply by Avogadro's constant. So one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, molecules. And that gets you 5.01 times 10 to the 22nd molecules, which is answer choice B. Okay, let's go to question three. An organic compound contains only carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. It is 61.71% carbon, 4.03% hydrogen, and 16% nitrogen by mass. What is its empirical formula? For any of these uh, questions where you're given the percent mass, it's helpful to just assume a certain mass. So let's say the mass of the total compound is 100 grams. Well, that means that 61.71 grams of that are going to be carbon, 4.03 grams of that is going to be hydrogen, and 16 grams of that is going to be nitrogen. Now, you might realize that one of these elements, uh, one of the elements in our compound is left off, and that's going to be the oxygen. Since all of these masses must equal 100 grams, we can just subtract all three of these masses from 100 grams to get how many grams of oxygen we're going to have, and it's going to come out to 18.26 grams. Now, all your chemical uh, formulas are going to be based on moles, not really the, the mass, of the com of mass of the element. So we have to convert all of these grams into moles. So let's divide by the molar mass of carbon, which is 12, and we get about 5.41, uh, sorry, 5.14 moles. Hydrogen has a molar mass of one gram, so that's 4.03 moles. Nitrogen has a molar mass of 14, so that is 1.14 moles, um, one four, and oxygen has a molar mass of 16. So that is also 1.14 moles. So our ratio of moles, uh, it comes out to 5.14 to 4.03 to 1.14 to 1.14. But since these are not all integers, we need to do something to make them integers. And what we can do is we can divide the whole thing by the lowest 
uh, number that we have here. And the lowest number that we have here is 1.14. And when you do that, uh, you get that the new ratios become 4.5 to 3.5 to 1 to 1. Now we have two integers, but we still have two decimals. And we can get rid of the decimals by just multiplying the entire ratio by 2. So that comes out to 9, 7, 2, 2. So that means carbon, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen are in a 9, 7, 2, 2 ratio. So C9, uh, H7, O2, N2. That should be an N, my bad. N2. And that is answer choice B. Let's go to the next question. Um, 100 mils of 0.5 molar uh, CABR2 and 50 mils of one, uh, 1 molar NABR are mixed. What is the concentration of the bromide ion in the resulting solution? The formula for concentration for molarity is going to be the moles of solute per liter of solution. So let's find both of these, uh, both of these two values. Uh, the easy one is going to be the liters of solution. We are adding 100 mils of, uh, of uh, calcium bromide and we're also adding 50 mils of sodium bromide. So that's 150 mils which is also equal to 0.15 liters. Okay, so that's the easy part. The next part is to find out the moles of solute. We are gonna have two sources of our solute. Uh, the solute in this case is the bromide ion. And we have two sources. We have, the first source is the 100 mil of 0.5 molar CABR2. And how many bromide ions are, are gonna come from this? Well, we know that in this uh, solution here, we have 0 0.05 moles of calcium bromide. And this is because 0.5 molar means that in one liter of solution, you have 0.5 uh, moles of calcium bromide. So to find out how many you have in 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters, you just multiply this by 0.1. And that will get you that you have uh, 0.05 moles of calcium bromide. Now, even though we found how many moles of calcium bromide we have, we need to find out how many uh, bromide ions are coming from this. And in one mole of uh, calcium bromide, we have two moles of bromide uh, ion. So in 0.05 moles of calcium bromide, we have 0.1 mole of bromide ions. So uh, the 100 mils of 0.5 molar calcium bromide is contributing 0.1 mole of bromide ions. Let's look at uh, the 50 mils of 1 molar sodium bromide. So we have 50 mils of 1 molar uh, sodium bromide. And similarly, we're going to be getting 0 0.05 moles of sodium bromide. And that comes from the same process that we did for the calcium bromide. Um, but in this case, we can say that the moles of sodium bromide uh, are going to be the same as the moles of bromide. We're going to have 0 0.05 moles of bromide ions. And that's because uh, the, the moles of sodium bromide to the moles of bromide are in a 1 to 1 ratio. So let's put all this information together. We know that we have 0.15 liters of solution and we know that we have 0.1 mole plus 0.05 mole of bromide ion so that's a 0.15 to 0.15 uh, ratio which is equivalent to one molar and that is answer choice d let's go to the next question um, one gram of hydrated potassium carbonate k2 uh, co3 is heated to 250 celsius to give 0.8, uh, 0.836 anhydrous K2CO3. What is the value of N? One thing that's going to stay constant is the number of moles of anhydrous K2CO3 that we produce is going to be the same as the number of moles of hydrated uh, potassium carbonate that we have. So the moles are going to stay the same. And you'll see uh, later why that's going to be important. But let's uh, first calculate the moles. So we have 0 0.836 grams of K2CO3 and if we divide this by the molar mass of the uh, uh, potassium carbonate which is 138 grams um, 
you'll get that we have 0 0.0061 moles. Now this tells us that we have 0 0.0061 moles of our hydrated solution. So K2CO3 um, and it's hydrated by NH2O. We know that the mass of the water in our hydrated solution is going to be 1 gram minus 0 0.836 grams. And that's coming from the law of the conservation of mass. Mass must be conserved. So if the K2CO3 by itself is taking up 0.836 grams, the rest, which is 0 0.164 grams, must be coming from the water. Since the K2CO3 uh, and the water are in a 1 to n ratio, this means that if we have 0 0.0061 moles of K2CO3, we have 0.0061N moles of water. This is helpful because now we can take the, the number of moles, so 0.061N, and multiply by the molar mass of water, which is 18, and we know that value has to be 0.164 grams. All that there's left to do is solve for N, and once you do, you realize that N is 1.5. So our answer is C. Okay, let's look at the last question. And relative to the other problems, this one's actually kind of difficult. So the concentration of an aqueous solution of a non-volatile monoprotic acid is measured first by freezing point depression and then by boiling point elevation. The solution is found to have a molality of 0.93 by freezing point depression and found to be a 0.83 molality by boiling point elevation. What is the best explanation for this discrepancy? Now remember our formula for boiling point and free uh, boiling point depression uh, boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. It's going to be change in T uh, B or F is going to equal K B slash F times the molality times the Van Hoff factor. In our problem statement, we're told that the solution is found to be um, found to be these certain concentrations, and what that implies is that we're talking about the value of the molality times the Van Hoff factor. This is important because the actual molality is not going to change. What can change is the Van Hoff factor. And the Van Hoff factor is going to change based on what temperature we have. Since we're, we're told that the molality is uh, lower at boiling point elevation, that means that the Van Hoff factor at you know those boiling point temperatures must also be smaller. OK, so let's see which of these answer choices uh, shows that the Van Hoff factor is going to be smaller at boiling point temperatures and is going to be greater at freezing point temperatures. Okay, let's look at A. Um, the ionization of the acid is markedly exothermic. What does that mean? Well, in our dissociation, HA is going to dissociate into A minus and hydroxide and, and uh, H plus ions, but it's also gonna produce some heat. If you are at higher temperatures, then that means you already have a lot of heat. The reaction is gonna be more favored to the left there's going to be less tendency for the HA to dissociate because the system wants to decrease the heat. This means less of the acid is going to get dissociated, meaning you're actually going to have a smaller Van Hoff factor. So at higher temperatures, your Van Hoff factor goes down, which is actually what we see. Because our Van Hoff factor is uh, lower at higher temperatures, our supposed molality at higher temperature is also lower than our supposed molality at freezing point temperatures. Therefore, A actually does make sense. But let's go over why B, C, and D don't make sense. Uh, B, the solute partially uh, associates partially into dimers at lower temperatures. The reason this doesn't make sense is that if the solute associated, um, then that means you would actually have a lower Van Hoff factor. And if, it, if you have a lower Van Hoff factor at lower temperatures, it should be shown that the freezing point depression molality should be lower than the freezing than the boiling point elevation molality, which just doesn't happen in this problem. So B cannot be correct. C, the volume of the solution is greater at higher temperatures. The reason this makes uh, no difference is because we use molality in our colligative property equations. So remember, molality is going to be uh, the moles of solute over the kilogram of solvent. Nowhere in this does it involve any volume. And that's actually part of the reason why we use molality in our colligative properties instead of molarity. So C is not the right answer. 
D, the boiling point elevation constant for water is smaller than its freezing point depression constant. This is just not true. Both of the, both of the constants are 1.86. So D is straight up not true. Um, so we're left with A, which does make sense. And that is the answer. Okay, that was the stoichiometry section of the 2021 USNCO local exam. Um, I hope this helped you, and I hope to see you later. Thank you.